Hello everyone. My name is Miguel Acosta and I'm the director of the San Diego County Library. And I want to welcome everyone to the KPBS One Book, One San Diego program featuring author Cynthia Grady's work titled Write to Me with illustrations by Amico Horeo. Today we are hosting students from all over the county of San Diego, but especially Rosa Parks Elementary School. Welcome students, staff, and teachers. The One Book, One San Diego program is a reading event that has enriched our region for 14 years, and the program includes more than 80 libraries and other organizations that support reading and learning here in San Diego. One of the main missions of the San Diego County Library is to support reading and learning. We encourage reading in every way to develop skills, nurture hope, and motivate a love of reading. This year, San Diego County Library customers downloaded over 4,500 copies of the one book, one San Diego featured title, George Takei's graphic novel, They Called Us Enemy. Cynthia Grady's work, Write to Me, is also available as a free ebook from our digital library at sdebooks.org or by downloading the free Libby app to your device. As you're watching today, you'll notice our children's program has moved to a streaming format instead of an in-person author visit for health and safety reasons. The great benefit about streaming, in addition to being safer, is that more students from all over the county get to hear from our author, Cynthia Grady. This year, the One Book, One San Diego book selection focused on the theme of Japanese internment during World War II and the connection this had to the local people of San Diego. In fact, if you've already read our feature title, Write to Me, you'll know that a local San Diego librarian, Clara Breed, did many great things to help Japanese American children and families that were involuntarily relocated from San Diego. Her letters and care packages helped to comfort and support children going through a difficult and scary time. Our hosts, our featured author, and our very own librarian, Cassie Goldewine, will go into more detail about the book. But I would like to thank you all for participating in reading and watching today. Before we move to our next speaker, I would also like to take a moment to thank our hosts, KPBS, their generous donors, and all the teachers and librarians in the county for championing this book and instilling a love of the written word, of history, and in strengthening our community. Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone. We're so excited that you're joining us here today. My name is Margot Borras and I am the program manager of One Book One San Diego and One Book for Kids. It takes a lot of people to pull off a program like One Book One San Diego and we would never be able to make it happen without our generous funders, the support of people like you tuning in right now, our valuable community partners, our libraries, our colleges and universities, and most importantly, our classrooms even when they're virtual. Write to Me is the true story of celebrated San Diego librarian, Clara Breed, and the very, very special relationship that she had with her Japanese American young patrons during World War II. I'm here today at the Japanese Friendship Garden Society of San Diego, which is currently celebrating its Cherry Blossom Festival. I am surrounded by beautiful blossoms and San Diegans who I know are smiling underneath their masks. I have special permission to be tucked away in this little part of the garden without my mask on, but as you can see, there are lots of people enjoying the cherry blossoms behind me. We hope you'll enjoy this special conversation with author Cynthia Grady of Write to Me. We have some wonderful guests joining us for this unique San Diego story. Cynthia Grady is going to be interviewed by youth librarian Cassie Coldwin, and Cynthia is going to answer some very special questions from local students at Rosa Parks Elementary School in City Heights. Now, if you have questions for Cynthia or Cassie about Write to Me or about One Book One San Diego, please put them in the comments below and we'll try to get to them during the live stream. We hope this conversation with Cynthia Grady today will help to connect you to this beautiful book and its themes, and especially to the extraordinary true life story 
of librarian Clara Breed and the power of books. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget to nominate a book for the next season of One Book, One San Diego right now at kpbs.org slash one book. Happy reading. It's March and we are starting to see this, the beginnings of the cherry blossoms blooming. And I wanted to just tell you a little bit about why the cherry blossom tree has such a, a special place in the hearts of Japanese people and our culture. Um, I think part of it is there's a concept called mono no aware, and it's, it's kind of the pathos of things. And it, it's tinged with a, a bit of sadness, but the sadness comes from the awareness of the transience of life. Um, you know, life is, is really fleeting and you see it right in front of your eyes when you um, observe the, the cherry trees because once a year they come to this really kind of a, a beautiful glorious blooming in the spring but that season um, typically you know for this tree would only be two weeks so in the Japanese people kind of take a lesson from that to, to, to say when we see each year that the cherry trees bloom um, it signifies for one thing that the beginning of of spring, the school season in Japan happens to typically coincide with that because in, instead of a fall opening like in the United States, Japanese schools start um, in the spring. So, and then also, also business fiscal years start around this time. So it kind of symbolizes the beginnings, but it also, you know, like I said, um, makes us aware that the, the end can, can come upon very quickly. So you'll see people spread their, their blankets or their straw mats and um, celebrate with, you know, kind of a fancy lunch. And I think night viewing is kind of trendy these days too because they'll have lights underneath and you might find people with sake and having a, a bento box um, celebrating the, the cherry blossom season. So that's, that's kind of why it, it's such a big deal to us. It's just that it doesn't last forever. Hey Girl Scouts! My name is Miss Camille. I'm Miss Alyssa. And now that we finished our book, we are going to get into a really fun craft. And just like all the children wrote letters to Miss Breed, we are going to be making a fun message in the bottle craft for you girls right now. You're going to need eight pieces of tissue paper for your puddles, one piece of paper to write your letter on, pipe cleaners for your stem, scissors to cut your petals, a water bottle for the vase, and a pen to write your letter. Okay, first you're going to get your eight pieces of tissue paper and choose out the colors that you want. So I chose blue and yellow, you can do pink, whatever colors that you want. So now you're going to go ahead and make sure that all your tissue paper is aligned. And you're going to go ahead and start at the edge and make a one inch fold, just like this. And once you're done with that, you're going to go ahead and flip it over and fold another one inch fold. Make sure it's aligned to the other side and you're just going to keep going until you get to the end. So now that we have our tissue papers folded, we're going to go ahead and grab our pipe cleaner. And mine's a little short, so you can always connect it to make it a little longer, so that way we can wrap it around the center. After you wrap the pipe cleaner at the center of the tissue paper, you're going to go ahead and start twisting it, so that way it stays still. So now you're going to go ahead and get your scissors, and all we're going to do is create an arc shape to our petals. And we're going to go ahead and do that to both sides. So our next step is we're going to go ahead and open up our flower. So we're going to go to one side and we're just going to open it up and pull out each piece of paper one by one. So if you made a big flower like we did, it may be a little too heavy for your water bottle. So you might want to use something like pebbles from your backyard water or anything to make sure that your flowers do not tip over. And we're going to go ahead and write our own letter, just like Miss Bree did to those that she cared about. So once you're done, you can do origami if you know how to do that. You can just fold it in half like I'm going to and add a little sticker. You can put the person's name on the top of it and then you can go ahead and stick that in your flower. And now it's time to give it to one of your loved ones. 
Thank you. Thanks so much for doing the craft with us. We hope you had as much fun as we did. See, See you soon. soon. Hello everyone, my name is Cassie Caldwell and I'm a librarian with the San Diego County Library. Thank you so much for being here and thank you so much to the Girl Scouts and to the Japanese Friendship Garden here in Balboa Park for those awesome videos. The Cherry Blossom Festival is gorgeous and such a wonderful reminder of the cultural enrichment that our region has had from Japanese Americans. Again, thank you for being here for this KPBS One Book, One San Diego event with our children's author, librarian, and poet, Cynthia Grady. She's responsible for our title this year, Write to Me, Letters from Japanese American Children to the Librarian They Left Behind. And it really covers the impact that Japanese American people experienced during World War II, as well as the history of our own San Diego librarian, uh, Clara Breed. So join me in welcoming Cynthia Grady. Thank you so much for being here, Cynthia. Thank you for having me. So we have some fantastic questions for you from uh, some students from Rosa Parks Elementary, their video questions. So we're really excited to hear what they have to ask you and learn more about the writing process, how you completed Write to Me, and this point in American history. A quick reminder for our audience, if you do have any questions you'd like to ask Ms. Grady, please put that in the chat and we'll get to as many of those as we can. But first, we'll have our first video question and it comes to us from Tan Bun. And let's see what she has to ask. Hello, my name is Tanja. I came from Miss Lambert, third grade class. And I recently read your book name, Write to Me. And I do have some questions just for you. My first question is, do, is this story true? My second question is, what are you going to do right to you? Thank you for listening and answering my questions. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank you, Tan Boon, so much for that question. So she wanted to know whether or not the story is true, which is a great question about fact versus fiction. Mm -hmm. Cynthia? Yes, thank you for the question. It is a true story. It took place uh, during World War II, which was about 80 years ago in the 1940s. And um, so if you know anybody who's in their 80s, maybe a neighbor or great grandparent, you could talk to them about this period in history and ask them what they know and what they remember. As for your second question or the second part of that question, I'm not certain, but I think you're asking how you could write to me. And you can look at my website, which is CynthiaGrady.com and there's a link there to my email address. And anyone who has questions or comments um, can reach me there. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for that wonderful answer and Tanvun for your question. We have another question from Randy this time. Let's hear that. Hi, my name is Randy O and I go to Rosa Parks. I believe that your book is interesting because it was a, a real story. My question is, why didn't he, the wards, let Ms. Britt hug or shake the hands of her friends? Thank you for answering my question, Ms. Grady. Thank you, Randy. I think his question was why the guards didn't allow Ms. Breed to hug or even shake hands with the kids when she visited them in Arcadia. Right. You know, guards in jails and prisons of all kinds, including um, wartime prisons, all follow similar rules. And one of the rules is they don't want uh, visitors hugging or shaking hands with the prisoners because they don't want the visitors to pass something onto the prisoners that they're not allowed to have, like weapons or drugs, or it could be anything. There was a point during the war when um, the people in the prisons and the Japanese American prison camps weren't allowed to have fresh fruit brought in. And so they couldn't even bring that. So when Miss Breed visited 
the children for the first time, she um, had boxes of books and and other things that the families had written to her and asked her to bring. And um, she had to give those boxes to the guards first. They would inspect everything to make sure there was nothing they weren't allowed to have in those boxes. And then the children would get those. And, and um, the prisons don't make any exceptions for close friends or relatives. They all follow the same rules. And that first time she visited, it was a little awkward and uncomfortable at first. And um, so by the time everyone sort of felt a little more relaxed and back to their old selves, um, the visit was over. It could only last a half an hour and then Miss Breed had to go back home. So it was a hard, it was a hard visit and a hard rule that they didn't, you know, it was hard to follow. Thank you so much for that answer and Randy for that question. That's a really poignant moment in the book. Can't, can't imagine how isolating and lonely that experience was for those children. So, you know, wonderful that Clara Breed was able to visit, but very sad that they couldn't, yeah. they couldn't touch each other. Well, we do have another question from Jonathan this time. Let's hear his question. Hello, my name is Jonathan and my, and I thought uh, Read to Me was a, uh, a interesting and good book to read because it tells us what happened during uh, the Japanese and the USA war. And my question is, why were the people in the prison camps running out of food when they were in the prison camps? Thank you, Jonathan. So he asks why the prisoners were running out of food in the prison camps. Yes, that's that's a really good question because um, people were actually during that time, during World War II, were running out of food everywhere. And so that part in the book that you're referring to, we think was an answer to a question Miss Breed must have asked in one of her letters to the kids. And um, because they, the food was rationed. And that means that um, you were given coupons to buy food with instead of using your money. So you might say only have one coupon for one box, one dozen eggs um, to spend each month. So if you, whether you were eating the eggs for breakfast or cooking them, baking them into cakes and cookies, you could have maybe one box. And so in San Diego, people's food was rationed. And so she wanted to know if that was happening in the prison camp as well. And the food shortage was um, for, it happened for a couple of reasons, but the main one is that the government wanted to make sure soldiers fighting in the war had enough food to eat. So most of the food grown on American farms or in um, the food that was canned in our factories was sent to the soldiers. So there was less at the grocery store. But there was another reason for the food shortage, and that was because there was a gasoline shortage. Most of the food in our grocery stores is delivered by trucks. But if there's a gasoline shortage, the trucks can't run. And by the way, there was also a rubber shortage. And so their tires, if their tires got flat, got, um, got a flat, the trucks couldn't run. So the stores didn't have an, enough food for everybody. So that's why they were, the food was rationed. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to say about that. Let's see. Oh, so um, people who lived in houses with yards could, if they had fruit trees or um, land, they could grow their own vegetables. But people living in big cities or in apartments without any um, yard to plant a garden, they all had less food to eat than the people who could grow their own. Um, but that uh, that bit about the food in the book was a very last minute addition to the story. I went to a conference um, on how to write true stories for children. And one of the people in the conference said, if you're writing a true story, you have to say something about food because food is the most important thing in our life next to the love of our family, right? And um, so food has to be included. So I asked my editor at the publisher, I said, if I can find one more letter to include in the book about food, can we add it? And she said, yes. 
So because I do think the food shortage was important to bring up and food is important to all of us. Thank you so much for that detailed answer, Cynthia. I think that's that's really true. You know, food is something that is important for us to stay alive, of course, and food scarcity is something that's really scary. And those uh, children were no doubt struggling with a lot of a lot of problems being imprisoned, but food shortage on top of it sounds very challenging. So thank you for sharing that information, and thank you as well for the question, Jonathan. We have another question. This one comes to us from Marnay. Let's hear her question and see what she has to ask. Hi, I'm Marnay from Rosa Parks Elementary. I thought Write to Me was a fun and interesting book to read. I was wondering, did you or your ancestors ever face this type of discrimination? And what inspired you to share this book? Thank you for answering my questions, Miss Grady. Thank you, Marnay. That's a that's a hard hitting question. Her first question is whether you or your ancestors have experienced any discrimination like those children in uh, Write to Me. I um, have a little bit to share about that. I was born here in this country and my parents were born here, but my grandparents on my father's side uh, came here from Ireland. They grew up in Ireland they married and then they came to the United States like a lot of immigrants do because they thought they could have a family here. And if they did, it might be a better life for their children. And my uh, grandparents or any Irish were not rounded up like Japanese American citizens were during World War II. And they were not imprisoned for no reason and like they were. But they did experience some discrimination when it came to finding jobs. They, um, it was hard for the Irish to find work. And it's hard to raise a family if you can't find a steady job with a steady income. But um, it wasn't just Irish. It was actually Irish Catholics more than uh, Irish people of other religions, and it was Catholics of other ethnicities too, Polish Catholics, Italian Catholics, as well as Irish. And so there would be signs in stores like, um, and advertisements in the newspapers that would say things like, we're hiring, no Catholics please, or help wanted, no Irish need apply. So that's a form of discrimination. Uh, if you're not being allowed to do something based on your religion or your culture or ethnicity, right? And, um, but, and it was hard for them, but it was not nearly as hard as what some people have struggled through. So I'm very lucky, my family's lucky in that way. Thank you so much for sharing that personal experience and the experience of your ancestors. That's such an important point that Marnie picked up on. And really the fantastic part about reading books like this is that we have the opportunity to learn about the struggles that other people have faced. And it reminds us perhaps of struggles we've faced and ways that we've coped with that. So thank you Marnie for that question and Cynthia for that fantastic answer. Our next question comes from Aiden. Let's see that. Hello, my name is Aiden from Rosa Parks Elementary. I have two questions about your true story book. One, who helped you collaborate and who helped you collaborate by helping you make the book? Two, how do you think this will happen in the USA again? Thank you. Thank you, Aiden. Two more very thought-provoking questions. The first one uh, about who collaborated with you to make this book, and then whether you think an event like this could ever happen in the US. So maybe we'll start with the team you worked with uh, to produce Write to Me. Yeah, it takes a lot of people to make us a, a book, any book, a small book, a big book. I collaborated with a number of people, a lot of librarians and historians, um, answered questions for me. I went to libraries and museums in San Diego, Los Angeles, San Jose, San Francisco, um, 
in Washington, D.C. And all of the librarians working there helped me find the information I needed. And I once and then I have my writing group who helps me make my stories better. And then once the book was with the publisher, I worked with an editor who uh, helped make all of the sentences better and make them flow better. And then Amiko Hira was hired to do the illustrations. And as she was making her sketches and then her gorgeous um, colored pencil drawings, I was allowed to look at them and sort of go over them based on the notes I had done in my research to make sure the things she was, the things she was drawing or drawing were um, matched the way my research told me how things looked back then, if that makes sense. And then there's other people at the publisher who talked to me while we were finalizing the book, the sales people, the art director, and then people in the bookstores also helped me um, launch the book at a big book party. So that was, so that was a lot of people. That's who I collaborated with. I think I've included everyone. Yeah. And fantastic. It certainly does take quite the village to write such a fantastic book. And you bring up a, a wonderful point about um, the illustrations and what they add to the story. They're beautiful. And as you mentioned, they're accurate and, and represent um, the experiences that the Japanese American children were going through in those prison camps, what those prison camps looked like. So that's a really important feature of the book as well. So thank you for talking about that. And then Aiden's second question was, do you think an event like this could happen in the US again? Right, my hope is that an event like this never ever happens again. Um, but you know, hope hope isn't enough. What it's it's really important to um, pay attention, to notice what's going on around around us. You know, notice when people are not being treated fairly. Pay attention to the way people are behaving around you. And um, I think uh, I think when you get older, there are certain things you can do, but when you're younger, there's a lot you can do as well. But the main thing is to notice what's happening. And I, th I think it's important to uh, talk about discrimination when you see it uh, happening and to tell someone when you see someone being treated unfairly to talk about it and to tell someone about it. Um, and those kinds of small things can help um, the big things never happen again. But you know, our government um, did apologize to all the Japanese Americans who had been imprisoned, who were still living and they, the government admitted that they had made a very bad mistake. And so I'm hoping that people who are in government now remember and know that this incident, this event was a big mistake and could because they can prevent it from happening again because they were the ones in charge who made the mistake to begin with, I think. Thank you so much. I think that's a wonderful point. And these questions from our students really illustrate that they are thinking about those types of things. They are paying attention. And that gives us such incredible hope for the future that these students um, are going to be our grown ups soon. So thank you so much. Let's see. Our next question comes from Armando. Um, hi, uh, my name is Armando Armando from Rosa Parks Elementary and um, I'm going to ask two questions about your book, Write to Me. But first, I want to tell you that I like how uh, you wrote it off a true story and how they had to leave their librarian. And I also like how you uh, included all the letters. My two questions are, were you one of the t kids that had to go to the tournament camp and leave the librarian behind? And my uh, second question, did you know the kids in any way? Did you know them after the war? Or did you know them when you were in the internment camps, if you were in the internment camps? And 
I hope I can get your answer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Armando, to another two great questions. He asked whether you were one of the kids in the story, which I think speaks to how well you transported your readers to that event, and also whether you knew any of the kids from the story. I um, was not one of the kids in the story, and I haven't met any of the kids who are now grown up. Um, I haven't met any of the people in the book. Uh, some are still living. Um, I have, while I was doing all that research I mentioned earlier, I have met people who know uh, the the children in the book or who knew the children in the book. And I've, there's another book about Clara Breed by an author named Joanne Oppenheim. And I spoke to her um, because she knew a lot of the children in the book, but I, but I didn't know any. Um, and, oh, I, I did want to tell you that since I've written the book, I've, I've met a lot of people who, Either they were in a prison camp, not the same one as the San Diego kids, but either they were in a prison camp or their parents and grandparents were. And one friend of mine named Nikki was celebrating her fourth grade, her fourth birthday. She was four years old. And the FBI knocked on her door and interrupted her birthday party. And they were sent to a prison camp in Idaho. Well, she and her mom were, but her father was sent to a different one in New Mexico, which is where I live now. And the more people I talk to about this book, the more people I'm meeting who were children in the camps. Thank you for sharing that. That's such a awe-inspiring situation that you get to be in to, to now meet children that grew up in the camps or spent time there. Um, speaking of which, Armando may be interested in our teen and adult selection this year. They called us Enemy, which chronicles George Takei's experience as a child in the Japanese internment camps. And um, the thoughts he shared about that were also very uh, insightful and touching. So maybe Armando will be ready to read that next. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for the answer. And Armando, for the question, let's hear our next question from Alayla. Hi, I'm Alayla from Russell Parks Elementary School. I really enjoy your, your book that you wrote. I've never heard about this part of you's history. How did you find out about Clara Breed? Thank you, Miss Grady, for answering my question. Thank you so much for the question. She asks how you found out about Clara Breed. I first learned about Clara Breed about 20 years ago. I read an article about her and I saw a video, a documentary about her life that the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles um, produced. And I was a new librarian at the time and I was so impressed with um, the work she did as a librarian that I wanted to get to know her more. So I looked and looked and looked for more information about her, but I couldn't find any. 20 years ago, there was not much, there was not as much um, online as there is today. So I went in person to the museum in Los Angeles and that's where I did all of my research to learn more about her. I spent about a week there going in there every day and um, I began reading the letters that the children had written to her because that's where they're all stored in the museum library there. Thank you so much for that answer. I think it's, it's exciting to know that such a big player in this part of history is from San Diego. Mm -hmm. And as a librarian that she was a librarian, that's, that speaks to um, our profession and is exciting to, to learn more about. So thank you for sharing that experience. All right, our next question is from Ailani. Let's hear what she has to say. Hi, I am Ailani from Rosa Parks Elementary. Aita write to me was very interesting and fun. I was wondering, how old are you when you first hear about the Japanese children going to prison. What inspired you to write about this story? 
Thank you for answering my question, Ms. Grady. Nice to meet you. Bye. Thank you, Ailani. So she asks, uh, first, how old were you when you found out about this period in U.S. history? I was about 15. So I was in high school when I first learned about it, but I wasn't, I didn't learn very much in school. It wasn't in our textbooks back then. And um, so, but I did hear about it somewhere. I'm not sure where. And so I asked my parents about it because they were in their late teens, early 20s during this time. And so I asked them what they knew about it. And um, over the years, the longer they lived in California, the more they learned too. And they started, they met people and they worked with their coworkers, it turns out, were some of the children in the camps. And so that's where I learned most of it, in high school from my parents. Thank you. It's exciting that our students today are learning about this a little bit earlier in their school careers, and hopefully that speaks to um, changes in, in how we discuss U.S. history and the things that we include in our education. Uh, something I wanted to ask about is um, whether there was anything super interesting or surprising that you found in your research that you weren't expecting, especially when you were reading the letters, that you, some of which you included in the book, which is my favorite part. Oh, gosh. Um, one thing that surprised me in terms of the research and writing of the book was my plan from the very beginning was I wanted it to be a picture book. So I was all of my focus and most of my notes were taken on um, from letters written by the youngest children, the picture book audience. But it turns out four, five, and six-year-olds and seven-year-olds write very short letters. And there wasn't a lot of information to carry the story. So I ended up um, having to go back and read more and more. The, well, I, I read all the letters, but I didn't take enough notes on the, um, the letters that the older children had written. And um, so that was a big surprise and a big learning curve for me in terms of always take more notes than you think you need when you're doing research because nothing was digitized when I was doing the research so I couldn't just go online and go back to a letter. Um, they're digitized now but they weren't. I wrote the book 15 years ago. Or I wrote the manuscript 15 years ago so it was a, a hard thing to learn, a hard surprise. <laughs> Those hard lessons are, are the longest remembered I think. But that's interesting that it it did take a while to to get from idea to book in hand. So in addition to all the people you worked with, there was also a lot of time spent on this. There was there was quite a bit of time. It was rejected for years. In <laughs> fact, um, one an, a lot of editors passed on it because they said they thought it was very interesting, but they didn't think anyone would want to read it or they thought it was too um, hard for a picture book audience and that they wouldn't be able to handle it. So the subject matter was, was challenging. Mm -hmm. Too challenging. Mm -hmm. So I'm well, glad it's me. Yeah, I'm glad it finally found a home. As are we, we were very excited to, to have this selection this year. And as you can see from our students' questions, those editors were perhaps mistaken okay. because they've clearly been able to um, take advantage of the title and really learn more about the way these American citizens were imprisoned and the challenges that they faced, as well as Ms. Breed's efforts to call attention to that, that injustice. So thank you very much. All right, we have another question. This will be our last video question. So audience members, if you have anything you'd like Ms. Grady to answer, please don't forget to put that in the chat and we'll have some time for some of those. So next up, we have Victor. Hola, mi nombre es Victor. A mí el libro me pareció muy bueno. Me encantó todos sus detalles. Y mi pregunta es, ¿en qué se inspiró en hacer el libro? Thank you so much, Victor. That's a really fantastic question. And, and I think what we all want to know is what inspired you to make this book? I was originally inspired by what I learned about 
Clara Breed as a librarian because I was a new librarian and I wanted to make sure I was a good one. And Clara Breed is uh, one in a long line of librarians who work towards equity and access and social justice. But she was the first one I learned about. And um, so that was the original inspiration is I wanted to write something that showed how important libraries and librarians were to the communities that support them. But as I learned more about her and as I learned more about the war and the prison camps and how American citizens were forced from their homes and imprisoned for no reason at all, I decided to expand the book and make it more uh, a wider but briefer story about libraries, librarians, children, and the books they share together and the work. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that's um, her story is fantastic to learn about and certainly the story of these Japanese American children that were removed from their home is heartbreaking but an important lesson to learn more about. So we, so thank you for making this book. Well, those were the last of our video questions from Rosa Park Elementary students. So thank you all of you very much for asking those. And that means we'll have some time for some of our attendees and the questions they've asked. So let's see what we've got. Uh, the first one from someone watching on YouTube is why is the book called Write to Me? That is a quote, that is something uh, Clara Breed said to the children, I believe at the train depot, the day they were being sent away. She said, if you need anything, please write to me. And the book went through with my publisher, with the editor, we went through, I think 15 titles before we chose that one. My, and yeah. I had, we had a lot of different titles. We tried them out and then the marketing team tries them out. But that is a quote by Lara, by Clara Breed. That's great. I think it really encapsulates what she was offering them, which was, you know, an, a lifeline to the outside world and anything that she could help with. And, you know, in these days of text messages and emails and instant communication, it must have been really heartwarming to receive those letters in the mail and also to know that someone on the other end was, was getting them and reading them and answering them. Yeah, so that's fantastic. We have another question from a YouTube watcher. Uh, what can we take from this book in thinking about the children who are being held now and who are separated from their parents at the border? That's a, that's a really important question. And I've been thinking about that a lot um, because when I've gone to schools, children in the classrooms where I have visited have had classmates um, deported. And so they make the connection immediately. And I think the, the takeaway is to know that we need as citizens, it's our responsibility to make sure our government is protecting us. And so um, it's, it's a slightly different case with the children at the border, but it's the same idea. They're being held, they're being separated from their families, which a lot of Japanese American fathers were separated from their families during World War II. Um, but in terms of a takeaway, it's to know that there are a lot of people doing a lot of work to fix this. It's an enormous crisis that needs more people tending to it. But there, there is good happening. We just have to find out who all those helpers are and find out how we can support them so that, so that this crisis ends. Thank you so much. That is, that's a hard question and it's a hard answer and it's a hard situation. But just like Claire Breed was a helper in this situation, we can all look for ways that we can, we can help, we can call attention to those problems that we see. Thank you, Cynthia. Here's another question. Will this book be available in Spanish? I asked my publisher that and they said no. I was hoping, I was hoping it would be especially in time for this event. But I don't know how they make those decisions, but it's not happening. 
Well, we'd love to see that. So that's too bad. You never know in the future. Maybe, maybe we can hope for it someday. But thank you for that question. And from a Facebook viewer, which camp did Clara Breed visit and where was it? Clara Breed visited um, first the San Diego um, people were sent to the Santa Anita racetrack in Arcadia where they were put in the horse stalls to live until the prison camp for them was built. So they were in uh, Arcadia, that's in Southern California somewhere. I'm not quite, well, I've been there, but it's near, near you guys. <laughs> um, and then the prison camp was built about, I forget how many months later, two or three months later in Poston, Arizona, which is near the border of California and Nevada. I mean, it's California and Arizona. And I forget the nearest town is Parker, I believe. Um, and these, and, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say back then, the um, Claire would take a train to mm -hmm. visit. So she visited them once at Santa Anita in Arcadia and once at Poston because arranging visits was extremely um, difficult. There was only one day, like you could only have visitors on Sundays and then you would schedule it and suddenly that Sunday wouldn't, the camp would shut down and visitor wouldn't be allowed. So she went through all kinds of hoops to try to even visit just once. It was really difficult. And then trains back then only ran at about 30 miles an hour. So it was a really long trip too. So that was, that made it difficult as well. Yes, that is, that is a long journey. And these camps were all over the West Coast, correct? There were some that remained in California outside of the temporary ones. Right. There were, there were 10 camps altogether and um, in seven states, but mostly in the West, but one or two in Arkansas. Um, but there were other, those were what have been called family camps where the majority of families were sent, but there were other uh, prison camps that were secret, secret internment camps. And they, that's where a lot of the fathers were sent. In fact, where I live now in New Mexico, we had four camps or prison camps that I didn't even know about until I moved here. And, um, and I've recently attended a lecture where I was told that um, there were 60 of these secret camps that um, house the fathers of many of the families. Wow, that's incredible. I had no idea there were so many. Are they still secret? Is it still difficult to find out where these were located or have they? It's, it's not. A it's not a secret anymore, but there's still not a lot of information available because every a lot of people are just now learning about it. The National Park Service has done a lot to put markers or monuments depending on the area and the um, at where each one stood. Many are no longer there. They've become housing developments or something, but some um, have been recreated and, and they have a museum there now. Um, I think the one in Wyoming has a museum. So the words getting out is much too late or it's not too late, but it's very late. Um, but we're learning more and more. I know there were some secret camps in Texas as well. Wow, thank North you for sharing that. Yeah, that's a, a piece I didn't know about. So that'll be important to learn more. Thank you. So another question we have from you, what's your favorite thing you've heard from readers? Oh, gosh, that is an interesting question. For uh, this book, I've received um, emails and letters from grown people who were in the camps as children. Those have been really interesting and rather sad to read. Um, in terms of readers, uh, child readers, I'm trying to think. They're, they're mostly just lovely notes and they, you know, share a little bit about their history. It's often I hear from um, 
children who are new to this country or their parents were new to this country and they they tell me um you know what experiences they've had that have seemed unfair to them that's must be a very rewarding part of writing a book is hearing that it has resonated with your readers it's especially um incredible when those readers are children and that you've you know you've touched part of their lives yeah yeah it's really it's really special because you know when you're writing it's a lot of you write we collaborate once the story has written with a lot of people but um it can be you know very isolating we just sit here at, i sit here at my desk and type all day so yeah i think that's an experience yeah. a lot of us can can relate to more now than ever yeah right right so another question, this is a fantastic one. Uh, were there any letters or postcards that the youths wrote that didn't make it into the book that you would have liked to have seen shared on some of those pages? Oh my goodness, yes. They're, the children, over a three and a half year period, the children wrote more than 250 letters. I think it's 260 something. And some of them were 10, 12 pages long. Um, so there's so much I didn't, didn't get to include in the book. And it was extremely hard to decide what the story arc would be and how to choose letters to support that story. So I, I chose as much as I could letters that mention books because this was about a librarian and the books she shared, right? So I wanted to include as many of those letters as I could. But then my editor wanted more and more letters about the war and about the living conditions. And so I went back and looked for more letters about that. But because it's a picture book for young readers, I couldn't include large chunks of text from the letters. I just had to pick out a sentence or two from each one. So it was really hard to make those decisions. I can imagine. Yeah, that's ex exciting that there were so many to choose from, but I'm sure hard to choose. Great. Is there somewhere where people can read read those letters now? Have they been digitized fully? They, they have been digitized. I believe all of them have been digitized. Um, and they are through the Japanese American National Museum. Their website, you just go, uh, I think it's called the Clara Breed Collection. And you can um, you can access the letters there. That's and fantastic. They have a picture of the letter, and then they have it transcribed and typed. Oh, up. perfect! Great. So, yeah, I'll have to take a look at that. I'm sure some of our our watchers will be interested in that as well. Here's yeah. another question for you: What has been the most rewarding part of sharing this story with kids? Oh gosh, it's all it's all rewarding. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's, I was just sort of getting going with school visits and library visits and talking to people, talking to class groups and, um, and then the pandemic hit. So, so I was, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's so far, it's all been great. It's just been a really nice reception, talk, meeting booksellers and librarians and students all all around. Fantastic. Well, we're very excited that we were able to have this virtual event because many of our things have, you know, have had to shift. We weren't able to meet in person, but it's it's wonderful to be able to reach people in this in this vehicle. So thank you. And hopefully someday you can get back in the classroom with with the kids as well. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry too that we couldn't visit in person, but this has been this has been really nice too. So agreed. Now, this is a question from a third grader on YouTube, which references one of the pictures in the book. And they ask, why were they wearing price tags? Oh, that is a good question. They were not price tags. They were um, identification numbers. So every family group was assigned a number. And I don't know how long they had to wear them if they... Um, but they had to wear them definitely at the train station when they were being sent away. That's how the groups, the military had clipboards with the family name and their number they were assigned. And that's what those tags were. 
Thank you. Yes, good good eye and excellent question. And just speaks to how important those illustrations are to support support the text. And we're we're glad that they're both there together. Yeah. Another question for you. What advice do you have for young writers who are interested in becoming authors and creating their own books? Well, I have a lot of advice, but the main advice you'll get from all writers is to be sure you're doing a lot of reading. And, um, but I also think it's important to um, get really, really quiet and just sit with your own thoughts and feelings and just start writing things down. I think you, if you want to be a writer, people say you have to write every day. I don't agree with that, but I do think you have to write as often as you can because you'll get an idea, but then it flies away. So the, the main advice is to read a lot and read all different kinds of things. If you read a lot of fantasy, read some nonfiction. If you read only nonfiction, then read, you know, poetry and fiction. And I think a picture book is the most perfect art form. So I think you should read a lot of picture books, even as you grow older in third, fourth, wow. high school. I know some high school teachers that use, write to me in their American history classes. So picture books are for everybody. That's fantastic. And I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that as we've talked about, the illustrations supporting the text can really bring a situation to life. We understand more clearly the pain and the experience that those uh, children went through as they were you know, removed from their homes, put you know, tags put on while they were transported to these camps. So a picture book can capture those feelings in, in ways that other books do, but maybe with an extra element there as well. So that's that's good to hear. We like we like picture books as librarians. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Here's a fitting question. Can you talk about your time as a librarian? Did you find a similar connection with children in your profession as Claire Breed did? I I did. I did. I started out as a like well, I had a few different library jobs. But my first one as a children's librarian was in a really small town library. And so I was the children's librarian and the young adult teen librarian. And um, and I there were kids and with their um, parents or babysitters who came to the library every single day. And I got to know them really well. And I loved that. That was when I lived in, near Boston and Massachusetts on the East Coast. And then I became a, a middle school librarian and that was different, a different kind of connection, but I still really liked it because the uh, classes came to me once a week for library class, but I didn't have to give them grades. And so I didn't have the same kind of relationship that they had with their teachers. And, you know, you know, people just tell you things when you're a librarian and it's really nice. You just get to know know people really well. I enjoyed it. I missed That's it. fantastic. Yeah. And there was a second part to that question, whether you see ways librarians today can aid children in those same same fashion that Clara Breed did. Oh, definitely, definitely. One of the things, um, and, there, and oh, there's so much librarians can do. One of the things I did when I was a middle school librarian that it wasn't my idea, but someone approached me and asked me if I would do it. And that was for um, a, a program for children who had a parent in prison, in jail. And what I did as a librarian is I supplied books to a team of people who went out to the jails and videotaped um, their fathers or the mothers reading the books book. And then this organization would buy that book for the child and give them the video because these were people who were in jails that were not nearby so the children could never visit their parents. Hmm. That's um, one thing that's that's been done. I know a lot of libraries do a lot of outreach in different ways and you just need to um, 
you know, talk to your librarians or, or give them ideas if they don't have the ideas themselves. But a lot of libraries do a lot of work like that. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you for sharing that experience. I think we have time for one more question and we have a YouTube watcher who wants to know if you are going to write another book. I am. I'm writing all the time. Right now I'm working on a novel about an animal fantasy about rabbits. It's, um, I love rabbits and I have two house rabbits with me right nearby. Well, they just, they just left the room actually. Um, so yes, but I also have a couple other picture books in the works, but I don't have anything coming out in 2021. So it'll be a bit of a wait. Well, we're excited to hear that. Is, is it for students of a particular age? The rabbit story when it comes out will be for probably third grade and up, maybe second grade, depends on what the editor wants to do with it. Um, All right. And I have a, another picture book for young people that I hope will be out in 2023, but we'll wait and see. Awesome. Well, myself and I'm sure our students watching will eagerly await those releases. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for sharing so much about your experience, both writing this title, as well as the history and research you were able to um, partake in and helping us to learn a little bit more about that. You're welcome. And thank you so much for having me. Of course. And thank you to our students and teachers here in San Diego for the wonderful questions. You also helped us engage with this content really exceptionally well today. So thank you for helping us there. We hope that all of our uh, watchers today, our audience, have had a chance to read and explore Write to Me. But if not, it's not too late. Or if you'd like to take a second look, as Miguel mentioned in the beginning, you can check out a free ebook version of Write to Me from the San Diego County Library's digital library, as well as request a print copy from any of your local branch libraries. So give it a second look or have a, have a first read through because it is a fantastic book and you'll now have all of this extra information from Cynthia Grady about her experience writing it. Thank you again to KPBS and to San Diego County Library. And of course, to all of the generous sponsors who have made this event and our One Book, One San Diego program possible. And absolutely to all of those readers out there, you're really the reason that we do these things and you make it um, a very positive experience for our One Book, One San Diego team. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.